Hello, everyone. Welcome to this first webinar uh, of the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean and the Wolf Institute uh, this academic year. My name is uh, Miriam Wagner. I'm the executive director of the Wolf Institute, and I'm also the editor of, in chief of Almazag. This is Almazag, the journal uh, of the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean, uh, which is a really, really good journal and comes as part of the subscription of being a member of the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean. So if you consider becoming a member, please do. It's really, really a fantastic journal that comes part of the uh, package. So last year, the Society and the Wolf Institute ran a series, I think, of nine webinars in total, a monthly series, which was very, very well attended and uh, which proved to be a wonderful uh, place for dissemination of new knowledge. So we thought that we should not abandon this very winning formula and decided to continue the series this year. Uh, again, to be run on a monthly basis. So have a look at our forthcoming program on the Wolf Institute web pages. And we have a few partners on board as last year, the, uh, the CSIG IMF, the University of Liege, University of Munich, and the Medieval Studies Research Group at the University of Lincoln. Um, many names in the audience are familiar, but for those of you who haven't been to the webinar before, I'll quickly introduce the Wolf Institute. The Wolf Institute is a research institute. Uh, we focus on religion and society, and we combine our research with teaching, public education, and policy work. And we're also priding ourselves as a place where difficult conversations take place. So please have a look at our website and our YouTube channels. Now I'm putting on the hat as vice president of the uh, Society for the Med Medieval Mediterranean, and I'll actually hand over to our president in a few minutes. Um, who is, the ch is sharing this session today. Um, uh, she'll, she'll talk a bit more about the society. For me, a quick introduction of how this webinar will work. Uh, we have a Zoom webinar audience and we also do live streaming via Facebook. Uh, so if you want to rewatch this or if you want to recommend it to anyone, it will be available from the Wolf Institute Facebook page and also on YouTube in a few days. For the structure, uh, Dr. Antonella Dutuscorpo uh, will uh, chair and will in turn introduce the speakers of today. Um, uh, so we're, we're very excited that uh, we have as a speaker for today the winner of the 2021 Dionysius Aegeus Prize, which is a prize that is awarded by the Society uh, for the Medieval Mediterranean for the best new book. So uh, Kayla Jackson is our uh, prize holder this year, and we're very, very pleased to have her on board. And uh, uh, Antonella will say a few more words. Uh, about her and the other speakers in a second. We'll have an uh, 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 introduction, I think, an uh, introductory talk by Kayla for about 35 minutes, then she'll talk to the other panelists, uh, and then we'll lead over to a Q&A session from the audience. Again, as always, if you can please put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, it's much, much easier for us to manage. So Q&A box, not in the chat box. And now, without further ado, I'm handing over to Antonella. Antonella, over to you. Thank you, Miriam. Welcome, everyone. It's fantastic to virtually hosting you um, again for the second series. Um, so briefly from me, uh, something about the society. Miriam has already talked about Almasak, that is a journal associated with the society. But the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean is dedicated, as you know, to all aspects of the academic study of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean history and culture from the 5th to the 15th century. Um, and along with the journal, the society also organizes a series of events, not just the webinar series, um, but for example, our biennial international conference. The next wonderful coming one is going to be in Crete um, in July 2022 and the call for paper is already out so please do um, have a look at our website uh, if you haven't already seen it. Um, we also have a number of uh, prizes, not just the book prize that um, Kyla won this year but also journal um, articles um, prize and we also tend to support um, early career um, scholars and postgraduate students with a number of uh, bursaries, such as those um, sponsored by the Simon Barton Prize that also um, will uh, be advertised soon. So keep an eye, check our website, um, because there's going to be um, a lot coming up soon. So today, um, we're really pleased to um, have with us um, Kyla Jackson, 
who's the author of the amazing book uh, that I also had the chance to read and appreciate by um, myself, the Islamic manuscript of late medieval Rome that she's going to talk about um, today. Kyla got her um, DPhil in Oriental Studies um, from the University of Oxford. Uh, actually following um, her degree in social anthropology um, and then her MA in the history of art um, from, um, from SOAS. Um, and she will talk a little bit more about her um, research in conversation with our two other um, speakers for today. We have uh, Patricia Blessing from Princeton University, uh, from which she also got um, her um, PhD, and she has worked, she has been working extensively on art and architecture of the Islamic world, um, with also a series of very, um, very, very fascinating um, publications. So her, her background is really interesting, but also her current research uh, that brings together text styles and architecture and um, material culture for the uh, late medieval um, Islamic period. So that's uh, a fascinating project going on. And then last but not least, there's um, Alison um, Ota that's also joined us today, who's the director of the Royal Asiatic Society. Um, Alison uh, got her a PhD also from SOAS um, on the Mamluk book binding, um, that is also what informed then her um, later publication and research. So I'll just stop here because I'm looking forward to um, hearing our speakers um, talking about Kyla's book and, and discussing some of the main themes uh, explored there. So thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes, and let's see. Okay, um, and the slide is moving. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for the um, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, the the book prize was a really really wonderful surprise, and I'm very very grateful. Um, and I'd also like to thank and welcome um, Alison and. Patricia, who have very kindly agreed to participate this afternoon. Um, their work and, and their support have been really um, valuable for my development as a scholar, and I'm really, really pleased uh, that they're able to join me today. Uh, so as I said, from my book suggests, the, uh, it focuses on manuscripts, specifically illuminated manuscripts. Um, the last part of the subtitle of the book, The Arts of the Book, uh, is a catch-all term describing figural illustration, illumination, or non-figural painting, calligraphy, and bookbinding. The manuscripts were produced in the lands of Rum. Uh, Rum being a term uh, used in our field to describe the Islamized parts of Anatolia. The manuscripts I focus on, 15 in total, were produced between 1278 and 1372. Most of the works are related to the Mevlevi dervishes, who I will discuss in more detail. Uh, however, there are also a couple of Qurans, a historical chronicle, uh, and some advice literature. All of the manuscripts are written in Arabic and Persian. Um, as we seemingly do not find illuminated or illustrated Turkish manuscripts until the 15th century. Uh, so the, one of the reasons I focus on illuminated manuscripts um, is because we actually have very, very few securely identified illustrated manuscripts uh, from this specific context. Uh, I do very briefly mention them in the book, um, but they are in need of further study. So just to give you a bit of historical background, um, the region had largely been ruled by the Rum Seljuks since the 11th century, with their capital at Konya. Um, this entailed a reasonable degree of political stability. By the mid 13th century, however, the Seljuks were struggling because of internal rebellions and Mongol raids to the east. In 1243, the Mongols launched a full-scale attack, which utterly devastated the Seljuks. From this point, the Seljuks became mere puppet rulers for their Mongol overlords. The Mongol victory also began a process by which political power 
or in Anatolia, formerly unified under the Seljuks for the most part, became fragmented and frequently contested between a wide range of power brokers. The Mongols, for their part, were not really interested in governing Anatolia directly, uh, preferring instead to send governors to the region, uh, who were often, unfortunately, corrupt and extremely violent. Competing with these Mongol governors, um, the local viziers and Turkmen princes, all vying for power and land. Uh, in addition to the parts ruled by Islamic polities, um, we of course also have Christian lands in the mix, such as Byzantium and the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia. This splintered and turbulent political scene continued from the mid 13th century, right up until the end of the 14th century, when the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid I conquered much of the Anatolian plateau and absorbed it into his growing empire. So in this context of political fragmentation, the importance Konya held as the Seljuk capital and center of political and economic activity was to a certain extent displaced to other towns like Sivas and Kayseri. Um, according to surviving manuscript evidence, however, Konya clearly remained a significant hub of artistic and intellectual activity. Anatolia's towns had been populated by scholars and Sufi dervishes who had migrated to the region from the late 11th century onwards. This travel was facilitated by trade routes and numerous caravanserais stretching across the region. In the early to mid 13th century, this westward movement of scholars and dervishes was also undoubtedly motivated by the destruction wrought by the Mongol armies in Iran and Iraq. However, even before these later migrations, much of the region was already populated by people of varying religious backgrounds and ethnic origins, including Persian and Turkish speaking Muslims, Mongols, Christian Greeks and Armenians, and European merchants. This relative ease of travel and the possibilities of employment attracted scholars and craftsmen to the region and helped to foster an atmosphere of creativity and productivity. The ethnic and religious diversity of Anatolia's towns uh, engendered a certain amount of intellectual openness and religious tolerance. It was certainly no utopia, but this favorable climate likely encouraged the migration of scholars and dervishes whose works and activities were perhaps seen as less orthodox and therefore less welcome in the more traditional centers of learning, such as Cairo and Damascus. In this period, when many Anatolian cities were beset by political instability, Sufi dervishes became important representatives of the Islamic faith and made crucial contributions to socio-religious, political and economic life. Um, for the purposes of this talk, a particularly important dervish group was the Mevlevis, who, um, as I will discuss, played a very significant part in the production of illuminated manuscripts. Uh, so just a very brief overview of how the book is structured, aside from the expected introduction and conclusion. Um, the book is divided into four chapters. Um, and each chapter groups together material um, broadly based on production location and the time in which it was produced. And each of the chapters roughly follow the same structure. Um, I first introduce the core manuscripts for each chapter and discuss um, important uh, physical properties and inscriptions. Um, and then I sort of expand this out into discussing the wider cultural uh, and intellectual and even occasionally political context where it's relevant. Um, there's also an appendix at the back of the book, um, which if you're interested, lists um, all the codicological information and translates and transliterates all of the key inscriptions. Okay, so chapter one. Chapter one starts with two manuscripts, um, both produced in 1278 in Konya. Uh, the first on your left is a very small Quran, beautifully decorated uh, in blue and gold. And the second is an enormous, extensively illuminated copy of the Masnavi of Jalal ad-Din Rumi. Rumi authored several Persian works, uh, the most famous of which is the Masnavi. 
an extensive text of rhyming couplets uh, that aim to provide guidance in following the path of Sufism. Rumi is also notable as the founding father of the Mevlevi order, uh, better known today by some as the whirling dervishes. Uh, in this period, however, uh, they were not an organized order per se, uh, but a somewhat looser religious community. Um, in any case, the, uh, the Masnavi that you can see on your right is the earliest dated clean copy of this very, very important work of Sufi poetry. The manuscript was endowed to the tomb of Rumi only five years after the author had died in 1273. Um, although they are very different in size, the two manuscripts have a lot in common and learning more about them conveniently lays the groundwork um, for much of the rest of the book. So the first notable connection is that they were decorated by the same illuminator, Mukhlis ibn Abdullah al-Hindi, who signed his name in both manuscripts. We know very little about Mukhlis other than his name, um, which suggests some sort of connection to South Asia. However, the exact nature of this connection remains a mystery. The use of the generic patronymic Ibn Abdullah, or son of Abdullah in his name, indicates that he was of non-Muslim slave origin, and at some point must have converted to Islam. Um, just to highlight that the two manuscripts were indeed decorated by the same artist, here are some examples of motifs that appear in both. So the, the, the more yellowy images are from the small Quran and the blue ones are from the Masnavi. So in the middle of the slide, you can see some examples of strap work, which is not an uncommon motif. Yeah, sorry, can I just, are you moving papers across? There's always quite a scratching sound. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there are papers. Be careful. Okay. Microphone because it's quite scratchy. Sure. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll keep them off the uh, laptop. Okay. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yes. All good. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, but uh, more distinctive, I think, are the uh, circles formed from half uh, palmettes on the left here, and then alternating circles and pointed ovals on the right. Um, these two um, types of motifs are actually quite unusual, and I have so far only found them in manuscripts from late medieval Konya. So these sorts of unusual motifs in Konya manuscripts um, have been really, really crucial, actually, in helping me to identify further manuscripts from the city. Um, Manuscripts uh, that I think are from Konya without colophons have generally been misattributed to Egypt or Persia. Um, however, through examining uh, the illumination of manuscripts like the Pocket Quran and the Monumental Masnavi, um, I have been able to identify, uh, for example, this undated Quran volume in the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery as another that was almost certainly decorated by Mukhlis ibn Abdullah al-Hindi, very likely in Konya as well. Um, very few 11th and 12th century Seljuk manuscripts have survived, so it's been quite challenging to really trace precisely where the motifs um, in the Quran and Masnavi have come from with any certainty. Um, however, there are general connections to um, medieval central um, and Eastern Islamic lands, which I explore a bit more fully in the book. Um, so for example, in the top left, you can see very large head and tail pieces um, and a relatively small text panel in the middle of this Quran. And these bear, I think, quite a strong resemblance to the page layout of the 1278 Quran from Konya. Um, and then on the bottom right, you can see the geometrically irregular sort of <laughs> decorations of this uh, 11th century Quran from Baghdad. And that it is poss possibly a progenitor of um, the types of decorations that we see in the Masnavi. Um, these sorts of relationships suggest that um, some patterns and motifs may have traveled from east to west during the initial Seljuk settlement of Anatolia in the late 11th century, 
Um, or perhaps even in the early 13th century, when many uh, were starting to flee the Mongol invasions. One element that appears in the 1278 Masnavi, um, which is actually here right on the very left, um, that is particularly important is the pointed oval frontispiece. Pointed oval frontispieces appear in several manuscripts from late medieval Konya, uh, but seemingly have very few uh, precedents or contemporary parallels in the Islamic arts of the book. Uh, the only uh, Islamic example I found dated earlier than this group appears in a tiny Quran, uh, possibly produced around the 10th century. Um, but I have no idea where this manuscript is now, and um, unfortunately Sotheby's couldn't tell me anything else about it. Uh, but in addition to that tiny Quran, um, there are roughly contemporary parallels with uh, Christian manuscripts. Um, this is something I'm still looking into, but um, in the context of Christian manuscripts and other art forms like wall paintings and mosaics, uh, this shape is often known as the mandorla or vesica piscis. Large pointed ovals with Christ in majesty at their center uh, appear in a medieval manuscript, uh, pr perhaps produced in uh, Nicaea, otherwise known as Iznik in Western Turkey, while several large inscribed pointed ovals appear in this early 13th century Syriac Bible uh, produced in present day Southeastern Turkey. Um, both the 1278 Quran and Masnavi were commissioned by Seljuk bureaucrats uh, who are otherwise not well-known historical figures. Nearly all of what we know about them is taken from their manuscript dedications. The Quran's owner describes himself as head of the courtly elites and the chamberlains, while the Masnavi's endower um, terms himself master of the servants and head of the commanders and chamberlains. Both patrons also make clear their connection to the powerful Seljuk vizier, Sahib Fakhreddin Ali. Um, and it is probable that both were freed slaves of this well-known and very powerful political figure. Uh, like the illuminator, Mukhlis ibn Abdullah al-Hindi, um, both patrons, as well as both calligraphers, also used the generic Ibn Abdullah patronym um, and were almost certainly converts to Islam, like many who served in the Seljuk administration. Prominent Seljuk statesmen like Jalal ad-Din Karatay and Amin ad-Din Mikhail uh, were of Christian slave origin um, and the wives of many Seljuk and Turkmen princes were of Byzantine Greek heritage. Uh, so this uh, highlights a theme that runs through chapter one and the rest of the book concerning the mixed nature of the region. Konya and other towns were inhabited by Christian communities that mainly consisted of Greeks, uh, but also included Armenians and Italian merchants. So, uh, specific numbers or proportions are hard to come by, but um, historians of this period generally agree that Muslims were still overall in the minority. Um, while we do not see frequent or significant overlaps with the Christian arts of the book in this period, the proximity to the Christian world uh, certainly did impact on manuscript production in Anatolia, as I will mention later. So the analysis of the 1278 Masnavi highlights the resources available to wealthy disciples of Jalal ad-Din Rumi and the success of the Mevlevi dervishes in attracting powerful supporters. Um, in chapter two, which covers the early 14th century, um, uh, we maintain the focus on Konya um, and it emphasizes the significant contributions made by members of the Mevlevi dervish group to manuscript production and the arts of the book. Um, again, this is a prevalent theme that runs throughout the rest of the publication. So uh, in this period, we actually have several extensively decorated Mevlevi manuscripts, um, but I'll only mention this one for the sake of time. Um, so this is a copy of Sultan Walad's collected poems, which are also in Masnavi form, that is in rhyming couplets. So Sultan Walad um, was the son 
of Jalal ad-Din Rumi and later the head of the Mevlevis. So this manuscript was endowed to Rumi Shrine in 1332 um, and probably produced shortly before its endowment. Um, it was copied uh, by a scribe named Ahmed ibn Muhammad al-Katib, Katib meaning scribe or clerk, um, who was also known as ibn al-Nasaj al-Maulawi, or son of the Mevlevi weaver. Um, in the Ottoman period, particularly, the Mevlevis have uh, the reputation as being a rather aristocratic Sufi group, uh, very much associated with the elites of the day. Uh, and, and indeed, even in this early period, they did have many elite supporters. Um, however, as other scholars have highlighted, Mevlevis were actually drawn from many Many parts of society uh, and along with artists and bureaucrats uh, the group included tanners, butchers, perfumers and cooks. So the copy of the Masnavi of Sultan Walad was um, by far the most elaborate and ambitious manuscript to have been produced by the Mevlevis since the 1278 Masnavi um, and it is nearly as large as this earlier manuscript. Um, these similar sizes are not the only thing they have in common. Uh, as you can see here, many of the same motifs and patterns are repeated in the later manuscript. Um, so in each pair that I've grouped together, the earlier 1278 manuscript is on the left and the 1332 manuscript is on the right. Um, these visual similarities, alongside the later manuscripts donation to Rumi's shrine, indicate that it was almost certainly produced in Konya. Um, but given that it was produced 54 years after the 1278 manuscript, it's, it would seem unlikely that the same illuminator, um, Mukhlis ibn Abdullah al-Hindi, was also involved. Um, I think perhaps instead one of his students decorated the manuscript, uh, repeating many of the same motif, motifs, but opting for a slightly different color scheme, which is not really apparent in this slide, but if you look in this middle part, you can see a slight sort of light purple, which appears much more through this manuscript, uh, which is generally quite an unusual color, I think, to find in um, Islamic illumination. Um, anyway, as the earliest surviving compilation of these, um, of, of Sultan Valad's collected poems in a single volume, um, the Mastavi Valadi was perhaps produced in order to fill in a gap in the Mevlevi Shrine's holdings. Uh, it possibly also functioned as an authoritative copy intended to prevent others' inaccurate renderings of the text. Um, from collation and reading notes that we find in other Mevlevi manuscripts, we know that the early Mevlevis were quite anxious to avoid the dissemination of errors in their texts. Um, given the visual references to the 1278 Masnavi, um, it is highly likely that this manuscript was also a presentation copy intended to be displayed in the Konya shrine. The similar size to the earlier manuscript, which was endowed with its own lacquered book stand, suggests that, the, that this later manuscript may also have been exhibited in a similar fashion although I've not been able to identify a matching book stand. Um, like the 1278 manuscript, it may also have been used during communal recitation. The large size and the visual embellishment of the text served to venerate the teachings within, while also displaying the endowers devotion to the text, its author, the shrine, and by extension, the wider Mevlevi community. Um, and the possible display of authoritative illuminated copies of Rumi's and Sultan Walad's works together may also have highlighted the spiritual lineage from father to son and by extension to later descendants who assumed leadership of the Mevlevis. Um, another key development over the course of the 14th century was the ascendancy of the Turkmen principalities, um, often known as Beyleks, um, the Turkish word for principality. 
Um, as the Mongols remained geographically distant in their administration of the region, de facto political power remained fragmented. And in some parts, Turkmen princes were able to take advantage of this to secure land, status, and power. Uh, this uptick in fortune is reflected in the arts of the book um, and is discussed mainly in chapters two and three. One uh, Beylik of note was the Karamanids who attempted to annex Konya several times, finally succeeding sometime in the 1320s. They actually managed to retain control of Konya as late as 1475, when it was finally captured by the Ottomans. The Karamanids were one of the region's most powerful and long-lived Beyliks, so it is fitting that we have a very impressive Quran commissioned by one of their members that survives to this day. So this monumental two-volume Quran was produced in Konya in 1314 or 1315, following a successful, albeit temporary, occupation of the city. It was produced for a prince, uh, Khalil ibn Mahmud ibn Karaman. Um, he was not a ruler, but we do know that um, aside from this Quran, he also financially supported the Mevlevis through um, building projects in the towns of Larende and Ermanac, um, both of which are just south of Konya. So as befitting its monumental size, the Quran volumes are extensively illuminated and they are written in seven lines of large muhakkak, which is the script commonly used for Qurans uh, produced in Ilkhanid, Iraq and Iran in the same period. Uh, while elements of the Quran's design, so that's my, my lights are going off now, <laughs> while elements of the design align with other Konya manuscripts, it is notable that other parts of the Quran's decoration are present in contemporary illumination from Ilkhanid and Mamluk manuscripts. Uh, for example, one of the Quran's um, illuminated text pages features these blue palmettes on red cross-hatched ground. Um, and this, this uh, distinctive design is seen in several early 14th century Qurans from Baghdad and Cairo. And additionally, the eight lobed colophon of the Karamanid Quran is quite similar to uh, poly polylobed inscribed medallions that we find in Ilkhanid manuscripts as well. Um, given Konya's trade links to other parts of the Islamic world um, and its potential attractiveness to itinerant craftsmen, it is perhaps not surprising that we see Ilkhanid and Mamluk motifs pop up in manuscripts from Konya. Uh, Konya was, after all, hardly isolated from the rest of the Islamic world, although its manuscripts are far less well known. Um, through these visual links, a picture emerges of a region um, that was not a mere periphery, but was an important component of the artistic and intellectual networks that crisscrossed the Islamic world. Um, in chapter three, I, um, I also touch on possible links to the Christian world, um, which of course formed a very, very important part of the region, um, but one that is not strongly reflected um, in uh, the visual tradition of uh, the Islamic arts of the book, in this context anyway. Uh, so in this chapter, the contribution of the Turkmen principalities to the production and patronage of Islamic manuscripts is further developed by looking at two uh, rather modest manuscripts produced for the Hamidid princes uh, based uh, in and around the southern coastal city of Antalya. Both manuscripts are copies of the same text. It's a Sufi advice manual, um, Mirsad al-Ibad, um, by the well-known Sufi author, the Najmadin Razi Daya. Um, both were copied in a small town uh, called Istanos, uh, but today known as Korkateli, uh, in 1349 and 1351 um, for two members of the Hamidid Beylik. One was a prince named Abdul Rahim, and the other was Isa, uh, who was actually the son of a former Hamidid slave. This again highlights the status and resources that freed slaves were able to accrue in this period. 
Um, like many manuscript uh, patrons in my book, uh, neither are really mentioned in historical chronicles. And these manuscripts are therefore very important testaments to their cultural activities and intellectual interests. Um, as with the Quran produced for the Karamanid prince, the production and consumption of uh, this popular work, Mursad Mir al-Ibad, um, concerning the Sufi path and principles of good governance, um, demonstrated that these Turkmen princes uh, aspire to be archetypal Islamic rulers. This stands in contrast to how the Bailey have often been portrayed in 20th century Turkish scholarship, namely as rugged romantic frontiersmen who bravely stood up to foreign, i.e. Persian and Mongol influences. In reality, they consorted with the Persian speaking Mevlavis and read Persian texts like Mirsa al-Ibad. Uh, going back to the Christian connection that I mentioned before, so this actually comes in the form of a uh, watermark, which appears in the second half of the 1351 copy of Mursad al-Ibad. Um, the history of watermarks in um, medieval Anatolia is essentially non-existent, um, so it's a bit difficult to contextualize this, but um, it, this example must, must be one of, if not the earliest, dated watermark from the region. Um, the shape of the mark strongly suggests that the paper was produced in Italy, thereby highlighting trade links to Europe. Um, Antalya was, of course, a bustling port city and one of many important trading centers in the region. Um, in some sense, it's not surprising to see such a watermark, uh, even though it is unique uh, in this corpus of manuscripts. The status of Antalya as a port city brought prosperity, um, as well as, unfortunately, plague. Uh, due to gaps in the historical record, uh, we don't know much about plague in this early period in Anatolia, um, but I did wonder whether the production of these manuscripts in a small town like Istanos, rather than in a major city like Antalya, sorry, pardon me, Um, rather than a major city like Antalya, which is what we might expect, um, was due to an attempt to escape the encroaching pandemic. Um, unfortunately, rather a familiar word to us now. Um, after the 1330s, we don't find many illuminated manuscripts securely linked to Konya, even though the city evidently remained an important economic and political center. Um, so I, I sort of speculate in the book whether the impact of plague in the region had something to do with this possible downturn, but it is, a, it is speculation, um, you know, there's really no hard evidence for it either way. Um, before I start to wrap up, I'll just touch on the fourth and final chapter of the book, which changes focus slightly to look at one specific manuscript patron. This individual named Sati ibn Hassan is mentioned briefly in an almanac written by his own son, Mustanjid, but otherwise he again is really not well known in the historical record. However, as is clear from these three very large and impressive manuscripts, he was certainly a man of some means. His manuscript dedications all mention that he is an emir, a commander, and a vizier um, or minister of some kind, uh, but any details concerning these roles remain unknown. Given that all three of his text, uh, all three of his manuscripts, pardon me, are texts by Rumi and Sultan Walad, he was clearly also a, devot a devoted supporter of the Mevlevis, uh, thereby again highlighting the significant contribution made by the dervish group to manuscript production in this period. Um, although I do generally try to focus on securely identified manuscripts in the book, um, it's actually not clear exactly where these manuscripts were produced. Um, none of the, there's a lot of inscriptions in the books, none of them mention a location, which is quite frustrating. And visually, it's quite difficult to connect them to an established place of production, as they don't clearly fit in to the visual styles coming out of 
um, say Baghdad, Cairo, Shiraz at the time. Um, Sati had strong links to the eastern city of Erzincan, um, and from several inscriptions, it is clear that his family were based there, but were originally from Konya. In this period, Erzincan was mainly populated by Armenians. Muslims were very much in the minority. Um, and Armenians, of course, have their own very strong tradition in manuscript decoration. Um, the use of silver in Sati's manuscripts, um, which is otherwise not particularly common, it's not unheard of, but it's not particularly common in Islamic manuscripts, um, was possibly inspired by this context um, and proximity to Armenian scriptoria, but it's really difficult uh, to know for certain. So Sati and his son, Mustanjid, and grandson, Muatazid, were all Mevlavis. Um, and beyond the three manuscripts that I just showed you, there are several other manuscripts, um, mostly Mevlevi texts, that are associated with the family. Um, however, I actually want to focus very briefly on a manuscript that isn't actually part of my core group, but I think it's really interesting. Um, so it's an undated, uh, possibly 15th century, possibly later, um, copy of Tariqi Chinggis Khan, um, History of Genghis Khan, uh, which is a Persian history text uh, that focuses particularly on genealogical matters and issues of good governance. It was actually written by Sati himself in 1378, six years after his final Mevlavi manuscript was produced. It was composed for a Baghdad-based Jalayarid princess named Ismat ad-Din Khan Garhatun, um, who was the wife or another relative sister, mother perhaps, of Sheikh Ali, uh, the son of the ruler of Baghdad in Tabriz, Sheikh Uvais. So the discovery of this Jalairid connection highlights the intellectual and political networks that existed between Anatolia and the rest of the central Islamic lands, um, though it's still unclear why Sati may have left Erzincan for Baghdad and how he established a relationship with the Jalairid court. Um, it is possible that he himself was a Mongol, um, given his somewhat unusual name, but it's difficult to know for certain. Either way, um, he has been overlooked in histories of the period um, because he doesn't seem to have been a political heavyweight. Sati was in fact easily the most prolific manuscript patron of Anatolia in the late 14th century. As a Muslim emir and possibly vizier from Konya, but based in Erzincan, with Mevlavi and Jalairid affiliations, Sati also embodies the cultural complexity of this context. As Jürgen Paul has discussed, this complexity has been overlooked in some 20th century Turkish scholarship. Uh, in considering this period, such works have often focused in particular on the Turkmen Beyliks and their Turkish character and downplayed the Persianate, Mongol and Christian contributions to the political, intellectual and artistic landscape. So just to um, briefly conclude, um, the book shows that illuminated manuscripts from Anatolia were um, relatively diverse in appearance in terms of size, execution and decoration. Uh, however, one of the key findings of the book is that several manuscripts from Konya do feature the same motifs, such as the pointed oval frontispiece. Um, this suggests that to a certain extent, the town had its own distinctive aesthetic. Uh, Anatolia's towns, particularly Konya, possessed active artistic and intellectual communities, which encouraged the production and patronage of illuminated manuscripts. This scholarly and cultural scene flourished despite local political upheaval that continued from the mid-13th century following the Mongol invasions until the unification of much of Anatolia under the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid I. Um, analyses also reveal that both local and emigre artists participated in manuscript production um, and that the Mevlevi Sufi group were particularly active as both artists and as patrons. 
Um, in addition to Mevlevi affiliations, patrons were generally from the ruling and courtly classes, unsurprisingly. Um, and the manuscripts that they commission are in many cases, the only evidence we have for their existence. Uh, converts to Islam also played a significant role in manuscript production and patronage as well. Um, and the lavishness of some of these manuscripts show how former slaves could amass wealth and status. The book also demonstrates that Anatolia's illuminated manuscripts did not exist in isolation from the practices of, of more well-known manuscript production centers such as Cairo, Baghdad, and Tabriz. And um, the traveling artists must have been a major factor in the creation and maintenance of these trans-regional networks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyla, that was fantastic. Um, so now we're gonna move on to um, our, well, our two speakers, Alison and um, Patricia. Um, I also would like to say that because of time, um, we are going to live stream until 6 p.m. However, if you can hang on, we will have a little bit more time, even if it's not live streamed, um, to answer any questions. So if you want to put in the meanwhile your questions in the Q&A um, box, we will make sure to collect at least some of them um, for Kyla. So if we can start with, um, I don't know, if Alison or Patricia. Alison, oh, I think it's... you're muted. If you... yeah, sorry, I'm on mute. It's, I think Patricia's to go first. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Patricia? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Kyla. This is obviously wonderful material, and there's much more in the book than uh, we saw today. Uh, so one question that came up uh, for me immediately uh, was that why uh, do you think we don't know, we haven't seen more of this material before within uh, the scholarship on uh, the art of the books in the Islamic world? Yeah, no, um, it's, an, it's an interesting question. I, I sort of wanted the same thing myself when I first started looking into this. I think there's a few different reasons for it. Um, I think the first reason is um, accessibility, which is obviously a problem for a lot of us who study manuscripts. Um, uh, uh, partially, I was, I was able, through the help of my supervisor, Zainab Purekli, um, I was able to see a lot of the manuscripts in the um, Mevlana Museum, which I don't really think had been very accessible before. Um, I think also um, mainly the people who have studied these are Turkish scholars. Um, obviously, unless you uh, learn to read modern Turkish, it's quite difficult to access a secondary scholarship as well. Um, but I think beyond issues of accessibility, um, I think that there are other reasons for it. I think one of them is an ongoing um, issue that we have with the study of the Islamic arts of the book, which is that there is a really, really strong focus on painting. And that has been there really from the late 19th, early 20th century, um, when the field first emerged, you know, um, and it was sort of armchair scholars and art dealers who were really in, you know, writing um, about these objects. Uh, really, they were all about painting. And I think um, that has led to a tendency for uh, illuminated manuscripts to, to get overlooked. And I think when people have looked at illuminated manuscripts, they've really mainly focused on Qurans. Um, and I think in my corpus, there is there are only two Qurans. So again, that's another reason why maybe some of the material has been overlooked. Um, and another reason I think that has compounded that is um, the nature of the period. Um, Patricia, obviously you'll know that it's a difficult period um, because it's it's sort of, it's a slightly awkward in between period um, with the Seljuks um, at the beginning and then you have the Ottomans at the end and it's a, it's, a, it's a slightly awkward period and a lot of attention goes to the Ottomans. And I think as well, until more recently, um, the period before the Ottomans is very much framed in terms of the Ottomans. Whereas, I mean, as you can tell from my talk, the Ottomans are really not, they're not relevant um, it, where the arts of the book are concerned. So yeah, hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Right. Well, I, I, I have a, another question um, 
uh, Kyla. I'd first of all like to really congratulate you on the book and the, the wonderful uh, images and how you've managed to fill a big black hole in our understanding <laughs> of uh, manuscript production and the relationship between the key centers in this period. So one point which sort of leapt out at me, even I think when you were doing your thesis was of course the pointed oval profile. And it really stands out uh, in the illumination that you've shown from Konya. And this profile is something that comes in later in terms of the Mamluk period and also on Ottoman bindings a bit later. And it's something that isn't really very well understood when it occurs, the sort of, well, I certainly was a little bit mystified. So I wondered if you could talk about this a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting one. I mean, fundamentally, it's it's tricky because fundamentally it's quite a simple shape, yeah. and it does appear in it does appear in uh, Islamic manuscripts, Islamic textiles, um, as a much much smaller motif, part of you know larger patterns and things, and often it appears sort of sideways, so not like that. Um, um, so, yeah, but in terms of, you know, it being moved to, you know, very much front and center of a manuscript, um, as I said, I was, I was, I, I looked very, very hard if someone else knows of an example, I'd really like to know about it, but that, you know, that very small, poor black and white image is the only thing I could find, but when you, um, look for, you know, mandolas or Vesica Piscis in the Christian context, so many examples come up from manuscripts sort of um, 12th, 13th century. Um, the, I mean, the two, the two I showed you were sort of from Turkey, but um, I've seen in um, English manuscripts, German manuscripts as well, um, you know, where you have Christ in majesty. I'm not suggesting that someone came from England all the way to Turkey <laughs> and brought pointed over with them. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of raise the possibility that, you know, given the fact that it's such a mixed environment, it made sense to me that, you know, have they sort of adopted this shape, reinterpreted it, obviously they don't have, you know, figural painting in the middle of it. Um, but yes, you're right, it, it then um, becomes, um, you, start, you start to see it a lot more over the course of the 14th century, although it does change shape slightly. Um, it, manuscripts from Shiraz, it's, it starts to kind of bend inwards like a sort of OG type shape. And then in, in lots of Ottoman books, you see it as well. But again, it becomes much, much smaller. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. And to, well, to tie in into that question of motifs moving, uh, you've also mentioned people moving. Uh, one example you gave was Mukhriz ibn Abdullah al-Hindi. But is this more? Is this something that's common in this period? Do you see more evidence for uh, artists, uh, calligraphers, uh, illuminators moving around? Yeah, I mean, it's um, it, it can be difficult to be um, sh sure because you're you're sort of mainly using you know nispas al, al hindi, so which you know they're not always a hundred percent accurate, but they can give you some but yeah you do you, you come across quite a few um different nispas al so so like al tustari from shushtar in iran al shirazi al bukhari from bukhara um al tabrizi um yeah so i think i think you know the the names you can't necessarily you know draw specific conclusions about it but as you can see with the parallels are, um, with Elkhanid and Mamluk manuscripts, um, I think it's it stands to reason that there must have been artists coming into Anatolia who had had experience working in other manuscript production centers. Um, you know, maybe they had bought sketchbooks with them. Um, you know, I don't have any evidence of that, um, unfortunately. Um, but in, there's, there's something I discuss in the book actually kind of going the other way rather than people coming into Anatolia um, is, uh, so one of the, uh, um, there's, there's an illuminated page in the 1278 Masnavi, um, a really unusual geometrically uh, irregular kind of design. And you see this design pop up in early 14th century Ilkhanid Iran, and then in later 14th century, 
in Mamluk Cairo. Um, and to me, and it's, it's quite a distinctive design. And to me, that sort of does speak to artists, you know, actually traveling from Anatolia as well and taking these designs with them and then, then popping up um, in other parts of the Islamic world. All right, which takes me on to my question, which you just briefly sort of touched on was, um, despite the um, involvement, uh, political involvement anyway, in Anatolia, um, the Ilkhanids didn't really seem to play uh, a major role in, in manuscript production uh, in the region. And I just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, you're right. Um, in general, no, they don't, they don't have as much of an impact as I thought they might, given that, you know, they were uh, politically in control of a lot of the region. Um, it seems that they mainly concentrated their, their considerable interest in the arts of the book, they mainly concentrated it um, in their territories in, in Iran and Iraq. There are a couple of examples so one which I didn't have time to mention um, is from the late 13th century and it's a copy of um, Al-Awamir uh, Al-Alaiya Al which is a really important historical chronicle actually by Ibn Bibi um, it's one of the main sources that we have for Seljuk history um, and it was it was dedicated to a Seljuk sultan but actually the text was commissioned by uh, the Ilkhanid governor of Baghdad Atamalik Juveni, um, and in uh, with with this specific manuscript, um, the text sort of talks about you know mentions him in it, and later editions of the text after he was executed don't mention him. <laughs> um, but uh, one one more um, Ilkhan example, which I actually didn't know about when I wrote the book. Book. So, which is why I never claimed it was an exhaustive <laughs> account, because you always find things up after you publish. Um, so someone emailed me recently actually um, about a manuscript that was, um, it's a copy of um, Hadikat al-Hakika by Sanai, um, which was one of Rumi's favorite texts. And it's actually, um, the patron was the son of the Mongol governor of Kushahir. So we actually now have direct evidence of a Mongol living in Anatolia commissioned a decorated manuscript, which is really exciting. So, sorry to interrupt temporarily, um, but just because we have got two minutes before the live stream um, concludes for today, I just, just to conclude the recording, I just wanted to thank you once again, Kyla, um, for her amazing presentation and Alison and Patricia to really joining us today and uh, and helping with really bringing uh, bringing Kyla's work to um, to live even more if you like with with questions that really help everyone to engage with what are also the the main um, the main themes and the main um, aspects that we want to explore so there are I can see there are questions in the chat so if we stop the uh, recording now and we say um, bye to our to whomever is watching live and uh, obviously to keep an eye on the program uh, for the next event in November and then we can still stay in the room and uh, continue with the questions so thank you everyone for being with us today Laura, can we continue? No. Yeah? Yes. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, so I wonder, um, Kyla, are you happy to take a couple of questions that are in the Q&A and then if Patricia and Alison obviously have got more questions, more, they're more than welcome to add them. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's fine. As long as, as as long as they're happy to stay for a bit longer, but if they need to go, that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can stay for ten minutes or so. Then I have to head out just because we don't have a babysitter today. But please <laughs> take the audience <laughs> ones first. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so there are a couple of questions. One um, is actually about. Uh, what kind of what well, if you can tell us a little bit more about 
the pigments and the palette used. And I wonder whether this question leads to actually question whether there are links and similarities that you can trace back with the materiality as well, I guess. So you said pigments and? And the palette used in the manuscript. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of chemical compositions, I can't tell you anything about that, I'm afraid. I really wish I could. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, that kind of information was not, um, uh, forthcoming, unfortunately, but in terms of pigments, um, really we see a lot of gold and blue. It's really, really dominant in general. Um, I think particularly as you, you might have seen with the, the small 1278 Quran, it's almost exclusively gold and blue. Um, and even with manuscripts where other colors come in, you know, blue is still really, really um, dominant. Um, I don't know if it's lapis lazuli blue. <laughs> um, I, it's been suggested to me that it's probably not. Um, I haven't, I, I don't think I've looked at enough examples of, you know, ultramarine versus lapis lazuli blue to, to, to be able to really tell the difference yet. Um, but I mean, aside from that, um, yeah, you do see lots of different colors coming through like red, mint green, um, one manuscript has a lot of purple in it, which is a bit unusual, and one has a lot of bronze in it. But in general, yeah, you, a lot of gold and blue. Thank you. And then there's another question um, asking whether you can give us a few, well, if you've got any, if you came across in your research um, to any other examples of Christian influence on the late medieval Anatolia's illumination of uh, mm -hmm. books. Um, unfortunately, nothing that was really compelling. I did um, look at Byzantine manuscripts um, and Armenian manuscripts. I, I mean, obviously, um, you might know that um, from this period, you have some really, really beautifully decorated Armenian manuscripts. And I think, I mean, I saw things that were... You know, when you look at something you're like, mm, could be, I'm not really convinced by that. So I don't really want to muddy the waters with it. Uh, one thing that I would like to look in a bit more detail at is Coptic manuscripts. Um, uh, because um, in general, they, they, they seem to follow Mamluk decoration relatively closely, which I thought was quite interesting. They don't, it, it's not as distinctive as I would have expected. Um, but I really don't know much about Egypt, you know, as a context. I'm not sure what, you know, um, how the how the traditions engage with each other. Thank you. Um, and just quickly to answer Mikhail's question in the chat. Yes, the recording will be available both um, through the Wolf YouTube channel and the website of the Society for the Many Mediterranean. I'm sure we're going to tweet about it. So, yes. Um, I wonder whether uh, Patricia or Alison have got anything um, else to add. Um, well, yes, I mean, I, the other thing which I think is quite interesting is looking at connections between the decoration of these uh, manuscripts um, and also um, other media such as architecture, metalwork and woodwork. Uh, I just wonder if you have anything to say on that. Yeah, uh, again, similar with Christian manuscripts, this is something that I looked into um, because, you know, logic would dictate that all these sorts of crafts were talking to each other and looking at um, what each other was doing. But I, again, I didn't find anything that was, you know, exactly replicating something. Um, but I would say that, um, and, and this is something that Patricia has certainly looked at in her book, um, architectural surface decoration in Konya at this time, uh, not just actually not just Konya, uh, um, across the region could be really, really elaborate, you know, you get some really intricate, beautiful carvings. Um, and when you look at something as complex as the 1278 Mesnavi, it kind of made me think, well, you know, was there a general taste for this kind of really full on <laughs> complex kind of decoration? Um, it's something that I would like to look into in a bit more detail, but there is actually um, a researcher now who is looking at uh, epigraphy, architectural epigraphy, um, Maxime du Rocher, um, in, in Konya, I think, or Anatolia generally, I'm not sure. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what, uh, what kind of uh, research he produces on that. 
Yeah, and especially with a lot of these, um, the Palmet scrolls and things like that, you get those a lot as backdrops for yeah. epigraphy. And that, that's, that's the sort of, it, and that comes up in all kinds of media, right? Because you have inscriptions in stone, you have tile mosaic, you have uh, wood carving. So that too is something that moves. Um, and I sort of, I think we have sort of maybe quite time for the last question, which is you know, the question of production centers. Mm -hmm. um, so where is all this made? Could these, are they workshops, scriptoria? Right? Could these places have produced other things like say templates for architectural decoration? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there I couldn't find any specific evidence about workshops or scriptoria. Um, quite a few of the Mevlevi manuscripts mentioned that they were actually written in the tomb, um, in the shrine. Uh, one was written partially in the shrine, partially in the madrasa of Rumi. So in between volumes, the scribe was moving around, writing it in different places. Um, but... In terms of decoration, you know, book binding, you have to assume there were specific dedicated spaces for this sort of thing, given the, the specialism of the, the tools that would have been required. Um, so yeah, as I was saying to Alison, I have to assume that these um, craftsmen were in dialogue with each other, but unfortunately there, there, there are no sources that really give us any details about it. Thank you. Um, I wonder whether I can follow up uh, briefly with something that I guess is, is closely linked with what um, Patricia has just um, asked. And it's because at some point you mentioned um, it was one of the manuscripts and you said, oh, clearly it must not have been the same person producing it, but perhaps one of the, uh, well, someone who must have learned from the mm -hmm. birth master. And so I wonder whether we have any anything that tells us about this process of not just the communication between the different um well scribes and those who are illuminating um this manuscript but actually the process of passing on that knowledge and i wonder whether there's there's anything that you know we can know about that um in terms of the process um i can't really speak too much about that but i know that for example so so at the moment i'm now working on on mevlevi manuscripts um in a bit more depth and one thing that I have found with with um, that material is that you can identify fathers and sons who are, who are both scribes you know um, you, you see the, exactly the same form of the name repeated with an extra name at the front you know <laughs> um, who is the son um, and I mean that's obviously not to say that it was only you know fathers and sons but obviously it was not uncommon um, for someone to sort of follow in their parents footsteps. Um, I mean, later in the early 15th century, so, you know, after the period that I'm discussing, um, there's, there's a document that's quite well known in, in our field, which describes um, a major uh, royal workshop and what everyone is doing in the workshop. It's basically a, re a report. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating because it actually, you know, it shows you the level of detail, how specialized someone could be, sort of one person just doing faces, you know, <laughs> um, and that, that kind of thing. So that's, I mean, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to obviously transpose that backwards into this context without really any evidence. Thank you. So I'm checking just quickly the question boxes. I think um, unless anyone else would like to add um, or ask any other questions, I would like to say there's been fascinating and, and a beautiful presentation as well. You know, like, I'm always so jealous about your PowerPoint just looked like amazing. And, um, and just for that, honestly, um, it's, it's been fantastic. But your presentation has been, um, has been great and uh, enlightening. I mean, I had the pleasure to read the book, but actually you presenting it has, has made it uh, really, really even more um, accessible, which is fantastic. Um, a massive thank you also to Alison and uh, Patricia. Thank you very much for joining us and to everyone who has been here um, today. And Kyla, thanks again and good luck with your future research. And we look forward to hearing more about um, those developments. Thank you all and see you soon. Bye. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.